Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. If you haven't told your friends about my channel, pause the video right now, tell 12 or 10,000 people, come back and enjoy the video. Okay, today we're going to talk about dealing with pins. Okay, a lot of students, when I get them lower rated players, as soon as they see a pin, they're like, oh no, I have to block the pin. So if they get to a position like this and they're white, they like automatically play bishop e2. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of doing that in a minute. But let's talk about all the ways you can deal with pins. One way you can deal with a pin is to ignore it. If it's not a pin that wins material, it just restricts the pin piece. And it may be that that's not a big deal at all. If you play a move like bishop e2, you're blocking the pin so that the knight is no longer pinned. But that's not the only way you can deal with the pin. For instance, you could put the question to the bishop and play h3. But I think most people will be surprised at what the computer's top move is here, which is basically to just get out of the pin by moving the queen. So let's make the board a little bit smaller here so we can see the analysis. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Stockfish, what's the number one move here? Stockfish says, <clears throat> just play queen to b3. That puts pressure on d5 and puts pressure on the b7 pawn, which is a square that was weakened when the bishop developed too early here. And that's the standard way in these kind of queen pawn games to deal with a lot of early bishop moves is to play queen to b3. Now, a lot of people would say, but if I play queen b3 and they play bishop takes f3 and I have to play g takes f3, that opens up my king side. If I castle king side, I'm gonna get checkmated, blah, 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 blah. And they say, that's no good for me. Well, there's two things wrong with that. One thing is, that if he plays bishop takes f3, you have this Vishenzug, queen takes b7 first, and when he saves the rook by, let's say, playing knight bd7, now you can take the bishop and you're up a pawn. The other thing wrong, and let's say you don't play queen takes b7, let's say you just play pawn takes, and we evaluate this position. If you think this position is way better for black, well, then you're pretty much mistaken. If we look at Stockfish 15 here, it says that white's ahead by about four tenths of a pawn. Up four tenths now, maybe now down to a third of a pawn. Okay, why is white better? Well, white's better for lots of reasons. White has the bishop pair. The bishop pair means you have two bishops and the other person doesn't. It doesn't mean you have a pair of bishops. It really stands for the advantage of the bishop pair, which means the advantage means you've got it, they don't. So the advantage of the bishop pair, actually just called the bishop pair, is worth about a half a pawn. And you actually have more pawns in the middle. This pawn on, G, on f3 is now stopping the knight from coming down to some of its best squares. So sure, if you do castle king side here, which is not impossible, but maybe not the best way to put your king in the middle game, you'd have to be very careful. But you have to be very careful in chess anyway. So I'm not saying you should castle king side here. I'm just saying that your king is not as unsafe as you think it is in a position like this. <clears throat> Okay, so one way to get out of the pin we just saw then is to move the piece that it's being pinned to, and that way there is no pin anymore. The knight can move. For instance, in this position, if black should play <clears throat> b6, let's say weakening these white squares to save the pawn here, then you could play a move like knight e5 threatening to win the bishop pair anyway and hitting these weak white squares on the queen side. And then later on, you, maybe you can play pawn takes pawn and bishop checks, if I can draw a straight line, up to, up to b5. So this is one way to deal with the pin. If we go back to the position we had before, the problem with playing bishop e2, which a lot of my lower rated players don't recognize, is it overworks your bishop, which means the bishop is trying to guard the pawn on c4, but he's also trying to prevent the double pawns on f3. And if you're not careful here, let's say black plays c6, and then you just castle, and let's say black plays bishop takes knight. If you play bishop takes bishop, maybe he could take the pawn here and try to hold on later. Although in this position, he really can't because of the weakness on the diagonal. Stockfish says if white plays a4 and prevents b5, he's going to win the pawn back with a big advantage. So... You just have to be careful because there are some positions where this bishop becomes overworked. And I notice a lot of lower rated players don't recognize overworked piece tactics. And that goes along with the fact that they don't study enough basic tactics that include 
uh, that include removal of the guard because overworked piece is a type of removal of the guard. The bishop is guarding the pawn on c4 and he's guarding the knight and if he tries to, as we said before, if he tries to capture the, the knight, the, the piece that took the knight on f3, then he can't also guard the pawn on c4. So overworked piece. All right, let's talk about some other things with regard to pins. Let's talk about Lasker's rule. Emmanuel Lasker wrote a book called Common Sense in Chess based on his 1895 lectures to the London Chess Club. And one of his four principles in the opening is don't pin the adverse king knight to the queen before the opponent is castled. All right, well, that's a better principle or weak rule to use in double e-pawn games, but double e-pawn games were very popular when Lasker gave this lecture. It's not as much of a principle to be used in other types of openings, but let's see why Lasker said that. So let's, let's play moves like that. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, Joko piano, and let's make it into a pianissimo with d3, and then knight f6, and knight c3, and d6. And here, this is one of the few positions where castling isn't always the best. And let's take a look at castling here. If you castle here, then black can play bishop to g4. And notice there's no bishop to go to e7 to block the pin. There's no knight to go to, sorry, e2 to block the pin. There's no knight to go to d2 to allow the queen to move. If the white knight was on d2, let's do that instead. If the white knight was here and black now pins the knight, if I can grab the right pieces, in this kind of position you might be able to play something like queen to b3 and not worry about it because if the bishop ever takes the knight he's not going to open up your king side. But if you have the knight on c3 in these kind of positions, then as you know if you played a lot of beginner games where you have these four knight openings, this kind of pin can be dangerous because black's threatening knight here, and very often I see my students lose games here. You know, they play things like bishop g5, knight d4, and then they're like, uh-oh, I don't know what to do. They play rook here. Let's have Stockfish play black here. Stockfish says he can't do anything about taking here, so he wants to play queen d7 first. Let's say white says, oh good, I can, I can double your pawns. And now white really doesn't have, let's say white does nothing here just for the fun of it, a4. Then bishop takes f3, if the pawn takes back, queen h3, and he's threatening knight f3 check, winning the queen, and also rook g8 check with mate. And Stockfish says black is mating in six. So if you've ever lost a game like this, you realize how dangerous that kind of pin can be. But let's go back and not castle for white. Let's say white plays Let's say he plays that a3 or something here, and black plays bishop g4. You can see here for Stockfish that bishop g4 is not black's best move. In fact, black should, he wants black to play the same move that I just played to play a6. Let's say he plays bishop g4. All right, now you can deal with the pin by doing what Lasker proposes, which is put the question to the bishop. And now Stockfish suggests he just give up the bishop pair by taking the knight. Let's say he tries to hold on to that pin, now you play a move that if you're castled can be dangerous, but in this kind of position is not dangerous at all. You play g4. If he sacrifices the knight to get rid of the piece that's guarding this knight, you could just play something like rook g1, and if he holds on to the bishop, uh, Stockfish wants you to get rid of this knight so he can't come up to d4, play bishop here first. Let's say, I don't know, queen f3. Rook g3 guarding the knight. Let's say black castles queen side. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Now there's no knight to come up. And eventually white's going to be okay. He's, he's got pressure here on f3, but he's guarding it adequately and black has no way to really increase the pressure. If he ever plays h4, white will just play rook takes g4. So that kind of sacrifice doesn't work at least in a lot of positions. But if he plays bishop g6, you could say, oh no, if I castle kingside, I'm going to get mated. My pawns are up. 
Well, first of all, you're not going to castle kingside. But secondly, this bishop back here on g6 is really bad now. He's blocked in by all these white pawns, and he can't get back in the game. And white has space on the king side. And here, uh, the engine suggests white should play bishop a2. Let's say black goes to castle queen side. I don't know. Uh, queen to, let's say, d7 again. Engine says bishop e3. He's not worried about the double pawns. That'll bring an extra pawn to the middle, give him a semi-open file. Castle queen side. Queen d2. Bishop takes e3, and now you have two ways to take. And the computer says you can either double your pawns or you cannot double your pawns. And the computer says doubling the pawns is better, which goes along with the principle that says if there's only one semi-open file on the board and there's no open files, the player that has the semi-open file has a pretty big advantage, assuming there's still rooks on the board. So this gives white an extra pawn in the middle, gives him the only semi-open file on the board. This bishop on g6 is weak. And the engine says here that black is worse by about a half a pawn. All right, so Lasker's rule, which is don't pin this knight to the queen until after he's castled when he can't do this h3, g4 stuff, is... A good principle to keep in mind. Let's take a look at the uh, center counter game. Queen takes knight c3, queen a5, d4, knight f6, and now knight f3. What happens if black pins the knight now? Well, Stockfish says, put the question to the bishop. He suggests the bishop should just take the knight and give you the bishop pair, but if the bishop goes back here to keep the pin on, Stockfish says, oh wow, white has a big advantage if he just breaks the pin and then plays something like knight e5. And now if you're in some lines you're threatening h4, h5, trapping the bishop. I realize he can go to e4 because the knight's pinned, but you can take care of that in a minute. And if he ever plays his h pawn up to free the bishop, you just take the bishop and mess up his pawns terribly. So white's threatening to mess up black's pawns and he's threatening to win the bishop pair. Look at the advantage white has. You need about a pawn advantage to be winning and not just better. And here white's ahead by just about that one pawn. So, so basically Stockfish 15 is saying if both sides play perfectly for the rest of the game, white's got a pretty good chance of winning the position already. He's, he's right on the verge of having a winning position. So that's another way to deal with the pin. Okay, let's take a look at yet a third way. Let's look at the famous inaccuracy in the opening the martial defense, where instead of playing e6 or c6 or d takes c4, which are the three main defenses, they're all pawn moves, white mixes up Indians and non-Indians and plays knight f6. This is a famous mistake. What should white play? White should go for awl. You can see the advantage for white has jumped way up from a normal advantage, almost up to a pawn already. Pawn takes pawn. If he takes with the queen, we can awl him with the knight. Most people take with a knight. And now e4 is a good move. It's the obvious move, and it's the move I see all the beginners play. But actually, the computer and the people that taught me told me it's more accurate to bring out the knight first and then hit the knight with the pawn, and that stops e5. And if you, if you don't understand this, you can go back to my video, which is called um, The Most Common Opening Inaccuracies, and we talk about this a little bit. But I don't want to spend too much of this video talking about the martial defense. I just want to show a game that was played. Knight f3, black played knight c6, white played e4, black played knight f6, white played knight c3, uh, black played uh, bishop to g4, white played, uh, threatening to take the knight and then take the pawn, white played d5, black played knight e5. And at the start of the video I said, you know, every time people get these positions, they're always ready to play, you know, bishop e2. And in the actual game where I saw this, the uh, class player who was rated at maybe 15, 1600 did play bishop e2, and he got a good position. You could see white has a nice advantage after that. This opening is just terrible for black. But after the game, I said to him, why don't you get out of the pin by just taking the knight? And he said, I can't do that. I lose my queen. I said, well, yeah, maybe. He never even looked at that move. He made a quiescence error. He just said, if I take the knight, he takes my queen. But after knight takes, bishop takes, white plays bishop checks. 
Now black can't put the knight in the way because white will take with the bishop. And the only way to get out of check is to lose your queen. And when the smoke clears, white's going to be ahead in material. So the player who had played white in this game says, but what if black plays c6? And I said, well, you could take the pawn. And now you're threatening discovered check hitting the rook or discovered check hitting the queen. And what does black play here? You know, if he does nothing, let's say he tries to save this bishop on d1. Let's say he plays bishop h5. Stockfish says white has mate in five. Pawn takes check. Knight d7. Bishop takes check. Queen takes. B takes. Rook queen check. Queen d8. Queen c6 check. Queen d7, Checkmate. checkmate. All right, so he can't do that. But what else could he do? Let's say he hits the bishop so he can take it if there's a discovery. Well, now we could check. And if he takes the bishop, we can take the queen with check, get a queen. And if the rook takes the queen, we can just play knight takes d1. And even if black gets knight takes c4, black only has one pawn for the piece and black's losing. Stockfish says white's up by six pawns. So... It turns out that my idea of playing knight takes c5 was correct when we checked it with the engine. And so one of the ways you can get out of a pin here is to say, well, it's not an absolute pin. He's not pinning the, the knight to my queen. So I can just take the piece and get a combination and end up ahead. Um, I'll, a rare idea, I must admit, but, but sometimes you can do that. Let's look at a famous inaccuracy in the Roy Lopez with a pin also. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle, bishop e7, rook e1. And now let's say black messes up and he plays castle. All right, well, here white can, let's make the board back to normal size. We don't need the engine for the moment. White can remove the guard on the e5 pawn since his pawn is guarded. If black takes this way, which he normally does in the exchange variations, except this is not an exchange variation, it's a delayed, and knight takes and queen here, white can just bring the knight back and the queen can't take the pawn because it's guarded. So he'd have to move the queen and then white would get away with this extra pawn. Let's say he tries to pin that knight so the knight can't take the queen. What would you play here? I don't think you had to pause the video to probably answer this, but I've shown this position to dozens of players, and you'd be surprised how many get it wrong. And the right answer is once you know that there's something there, then you start to look for it. If you don't know it's there, I've seen people play this kind of position in a game and not realize it. They go, my knight's pinned, I can't move it, so I'll have to look for other moves like d3 or knight c3. But the right move is to play knight takes d4, you get a queen, he gets your queen, and then you get an extra bishop at the end. When I ask people what kind of tactic this is, they say, well, this is just analysis, or this is black's blunder. I go, well, these things are all true, but when you win material by force, it's a tactic, and we'd like to give all the tactics a name so we can categorize them. And this is the tactic that nobody had named until I wrote an article about this about 20-some years ago. And I talked and I said, you know, if you calculate stuff like this, and it doesn't win anything, then it's not a tactic. But when you do win something and it's a tactic, I call this tactic counting. You could do counting and not win material, when in case counting is not a tactic. But if counting does win material, then it becomes a tactic. Just like if a pin doesn't win a material, it's not a tactic. This bishop to g4 is not a tactic for black. Actually, it's a tactic for white. But it, here the pin itself is not a tactic. He's just re trying to restrict the knight. Same thing with double attack. You could double attack two things, and if the other person can find a way to save both things, then your double attack is a concept, but it's not a tactic unless it actually wins something. Well, here, knight takes d4 wins something. So in my article about this, and then in my book, Back to Basics Tactics, I called the, uh, this was the first chapter in the book, I called this idea counting, which is, I get to take something, you get to take something, I get to take it back. Notice this is not single square counting, which is the, which is the most typical and most simple type of counting. This is multi-square counting. To do this, we have to count on d4 and on d1. And it turns out on d4, white is winning a queen for nothing. On d1, white's losing a queen for a bishop. But the net result is that white's winning a bishop. So that 
Bishop g4 allows white a counting tactic, and again, the way to deal with this pin is move the pin piece. Obviously, if you can move the pin piece and it is a um, checkmate, well, then you wouldn't be worried about losing your queen. Let's take a look at uh, take a look at Legal's. Well, Legal's is d6, bishop c4. Now black has to play something silly like h6. White plays knight c3, and black pins with bishop g4. All right, this this tactic is called Legal's mate, and the move that you play here is again to move the pin piece. This is not a normal way of dealing with a pin, of course. Knight takes on e5. If he takes the queen, bishop takes f7 check. King e7 only move. Knight d5, Checkmate. very pretty. Legal's mate. What if he doesn't take... Well, if he doesn't take the queen... Bishop here, we need some bad move, like he's trying to stop knight g5. Knight c3, bishop here... If he takes the knight, then you take the bishop and you win a pawn and you get the bishop pair and you're ahead in development. If you he, if you take here and he tries to guard the squares, let's see what Stockfish thinks is the, I think the best thing is bishop takes bishop. And now he can't take the bishop because queen h5 check is going to be disastrous. So he has to take the knight. And now you play queen h5 anyway pinning the pawn and threatening to take it. If he plays something like queen e7, you can actually play the cute tactic knight d5, and he can't take the bishop because of the fork. The more you see these kind of tactics, the more you can find them really quickly when you're playing games. You know, this stuff is not uh, things that we've never seen before. He can't take the bishop... Well, he, he couldn't take the bishop with the pawn before. Uh, if he plays... Uh, Let's say queen e7, if he plays g6, you can play queen takes e5 as his Vishenzug, counterattacking the rook, and now if he takes the bishop, you can take the rook. And if black hits the queen again, then that pawn is no longer hitting the bishop, and now you can just move the queen back, and you're up a few pawns. So if we go back here to knight takes e5, knight takes e5 is plus 2.7. If you don't see that, and you play the second best move, which is to put the question to the bishop, or play d4 now. White's advantage is only about a pawn, instead of being winning with about 2.6. So pins, 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 pins. Now, are we saying that you should never play moves like bishop e2 or something like that? No, you know, there are positions where, you know, someone gets an annoying pin and we're just going to pretend here that there's some annoying pin here. Now normally if someone uh, pins this knight in this position, the bishop's only move is to go to e2 anyway. So, you know, wh while I would probably play h3 here and, and put the question to the bishop, in this kind of position, you know, there's nothing terribly wrong with playing bishop e2. I'm sure it's uh, even though it's probably not the number one computer move, it's probably in there. In fact, the computer thinks you should move this pawn again, which shows you how bad it was to play d3. You should be playing d4 in positions like this. So bishop e2, you can see, is not even in the top three. Let's see if it makes the top five. It does make the top five. Right now, it's fighting for third. It's third or fourth. Stockfish says, putting the question to the bishop, which is my first thought, is the number one idea. But... Playing bishop e2 here is not ridiculous. So there are positions when you put something in between the piece that's being pinned to the pin piece like this to get out of the pin, and that's perfectly okay. But it's not the only way. The purpose of this video is to tell you, yes, that can be a good way in a lot of positions, but it's not the only way, and a lot of times it's not even close to the best way. So hopefully you, you watch this video and you realize there's lots of ways to deal with pins. You can ignore them. Sometimes the best way to get out of a pin to your king, let's let's pin this to the king. Let's say black plays bishop here and you play here. And now you're wondering, how, how do I get rid of this pin? Well, you could play bishop d2, but and bishop d2 is okay. We can see it down here. Let's turn off the engine for the moment. But one of the best ways to get out of this pin would just be to continue to develop 
and just castle, and now your knight's not pinned anymore. Now your knight's free to move. The best way to get out of that pin was rather than putting your bishop on a passive square like d2, just castle. Let's ask Stockfish in this position, what's his number one move? Look at that. Number one move, castle. Oops, now he's making me a liar. Number, But castle or bishop g5. But the but bishop d2 is not higher than, ca than castles. Castles gets you out of the pin. A lot of times the best way to get out of the pin to a king is castle. Just continue your development. Okay, I got to get rolling. Uh, please tell your friends about the channel. If you like the video, you can like. If you subscribe, we can get that. We're trying to hit 5,000 subscribers. We're getting close. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.